Hey everybody and welcome to Database Camp. My name is Sarah and in today's video I'm going to be continuing my reading of Racism in America. So if you wanted to know a little bit more about the book, what inspired me to make this video, and also me reading the forward, please do check out the first video of this series. I will have the link posted down below in the description if you're interested. So in today's video, I'm going to be reading the fourth excerpt entitled Southern Horrors, Women and the Politics of Rape and Lynching by Crystal N. Feimster. So a little bit of background. In Southern Horrors, Crystal N. Feimster provides a startling view into the Jim Crow South where the precarious and subordinate position of women linked black and white anti-rape activists together in fragile political alliances. It is a story that reveals how the complex drama of political power, race, and sex played out in the lives of Southern women. In this excerpt, Feimster discusses how African Americans, including the parents of anti-lynching activists Ida B. Wells, navigated the fraught landscape of emancipation after the Civil War. As a young black girl growing up during the pitched battles of Reconstruction, Ida B. Wells learned firsthand that the brutality and violence that characterized black-white relations in the Plantation South had not vanished with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Newly freed black women were unwilling to return to the antebellum sexual and racial status quo that allowed white men to rape and brutalize them with impunity. Indeed, for Ida B. Wells and the millions of black women in the South, another war had just begun. Their battle for legal protection not only made visible the previously muted racial and sexual violence against black women, but also radically influenced the politics of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow. James and Elizabeth Wells joined the newly founded Asbury Methodist Church, a branch of the Methodist Episcopal Church. James then became a Mason and eventually joined the Loyal League, a Republican organization created to protect black voting rights. Eager to put the painful and violent memories of slavery behind them, freed men and women all over the South built churches, formed lodges, created newspapers, established political organizations, took control of their labor, and ran for political office when possible. They no longer had to meet under the cover of darkness to worship, to organize politically, or to educate themselves and their children. Former slaves organized Negro conventions and passed resolutions demanding the full rights of citizenship, including the franchise, access to land, fair wages, and protection against white violence. In June 1865, black Mississippians held a mass meeting in Vicksburg at which they condemned the exclusion of loyal citizens from the upcoming elections and called on Congress to refuse the state readmission until black men were given the right to vote. In Jackson, Black washerwomen organized a labor strike and called on the mayor to support their demands for a uniform rate of pay for their work. Indeed, from Mississippi to Virginia, black men and women articulated their desire for economic and political power and insisted on the right to control their labor, defend their families, and live without white interference. Emancipation, however, had not changed the way many Southern whites viewed black men and women as property. Former slaves felt 
the limits of their freedom most when they acted politically or sought to manage their own labor. Southern whites resorted to intimidation, ostracism, theft, whippings, rape, and even murder to regain control over black people. In December 1865, Colonel Samuel Thomas, assistant commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, reported to Congress, wherever I go, the street, the shop, the house, or the steamboat, I hear the people talk in such a way as to indicate that they are yet unable to conceive of the Negro as possessing any rights at all. To kill a Negro, they do not deem murder. To debauch a Negro woman, they do not think fornication. To take the property away from a Negro, they do not consider robbery. Thus, Colonel Thomas rightfully observed of Southern whites, they may admit that the individual relations of masters and slaves have been destroyed by the war and the President's Emancipation Proclamation, but they still have an ingrained feeling that the blacks at large belong to the whites at large, and whenever opportunity serves, they treat the colored people just as their profit, caprice, or passion may dictate. Intent on treating newly freed men and women as they had under slavery, and unwilling to relinquish notions of white supremacy that held blacks as undeserving of civil and political rights, southern planters, whether compelled by caprice or passion, unleashed an unprecedented wave of violence against their former slaves who were no longer valued as property worthy of protection. In the years immediately following emancipation, white violence tended to be localized and personal, usually having to do with disputes over labor or rules of proper racial etiquette. In vivid testimony before the U.S. Senate, former slave Henry Adams of Louisiana recalled how, in 1865, Southern whites used threats and violence to limit black freedom. To ensure black deference, and to establish a cheap labor force. Adams explained how his former master intimidated ex-slaves into signing labor contracts by promising to protect them from the bad white men who would kill them just for fun. Or his master's 60 former slaves, Adams was one of only two men who refused to sign a contract. Even when blacks refused to commit their labor to a single planter, they found it difficult to move from one plantation to another. According to Adam, whites used a combination of violence and the pre-war pass system to prevent former slaves from moving freely. As a test of his freedom and against the wishes of his former master, Adams refused to carry a pass during a week-long trip to Shreveport Four white men stopped him six miles south of Kichi and asked him whom he belonged to. When Adams declared he belonged to no one, three of the men beat him with a stick and threatened to kill him before letting him go at the request of the fourth man. I seen over twelve colored men and women beat, shot and hung between there and Shreveport he testified, convinced that freedom meant that every man would have rights and the power to protect himself, Adams, like many ex-slaves, challenged White's assumed power over him and his family. When his 15-year-old sister suffered brutal beatings from both the madam and the boss, he, along with a large number of young colored people, decided to leave the plantation in protest. En route to Shreveport, the group fell victim to a mob of 40 white men who shot at them, took Adams's horse, robbed them of their clothes and bedclothing and money, and forced their return. According to Adams, the crowd of white men broke up five churches as well. Thousands, he concluded, had been killed for trying to be free. 
Riots, Rape, and Radical Reconstruction Former slaves had many reasons for wanting to escape plantations for towns and cities. Cities like Shreveport, or even smaller towns like Holly Springs, not only provided anonymity and freedom from white surveillance, but also made possible better education, financial independence, and new political opportunities. Finding wage labor was not always easy, but for those with skills like James Wells, there was usually plenty of work. Tradesmen fared much better than their rural counterparts, who were often forced to live hand-to-mouth in search of a steady income. As a skilled carpenter, Wells was able to earn enough money to provide for his family. More importantly, his economic success meant that Elizabeth and the children did not have to labor as domestics in the homes of white folks. Because Elizabeth worked at home, and the children's only job, as Ida explained, was to go to school and learn all we could, they escaped the violence inherent in black-white labor relations. Town and city life, however, was not without hardship or free of white violence. In the post-war period, urban riots were the most visible sign of the efforts by white Southerners to stamp down black political mobilization and prevent economic independence. Ida was four years old when reports came from Memphis, only 30 miles away, that whites angered by the presence of black militiamen had attacked the city's black community, murdering, beating, and raping its inhabitants and burning homes and businesses in a three-day riot. Even though the riot did not directly affect Ida's immediate family, they must have felt the sense of menace and terror that swept through their community and the surrounding area as news spread that white rioters had killed 46 blacks, raped at least five black women, and injured hundreds more. The riot drew national attention, and a congressional committee traveled to Memphis to investigate. For the first time, black women asserted their legal claim to personal and sexual autonomy before a national audience. The committee found, It is a singular fact that while this mob was breathing vengeance against the Negroes and shooting them down like dogs, yet when they found unprotected colored women, they at once conquered their prejudices and proceeded to violate them under circumstances of the most licentious brutality. Black women and men bravely testified before the committee. Sixteen-year-old Lucy Smith testified that seven white men, two of them police officers, broke into her home during the riot and brutally raped her. One of them, she explained, choked me by the neck. After the first man had connection with me, another got hold of me and tried to violate me. But I was so bad he did not. He gave me a lick with his fist and said I was so damn near dead he would not have anything to do with me. I bled from what the first man had done to me. I was injured right smart. Denied legal protection against rape under slavery, Smith and the four other rape victims challenged long-held beliefs that black women welcomed white men's sexual advances. In response to their testimonies, the committee's final report concluded, The crowning acts of atrocity and diabolism committed during these terrible nights were the ravishing of five different colored women by these fiends in human shape. For black women, such a declaration confirmed their new rights as citizens and marked a radical change in national politics. These rights, which were based on ideas that had begun with abolitionist literature on the violation of slave women, gained currency during the Civil War when black women testified to sexual assaults at court-martial trials. In the post-war context, such testimony gave voice to black women's suffering and their demands for legal protection. 
The Congressional Committee's declaration defined black women as political persons worthy of federal protection against racial and sexual violence. Even though Ida Wells was too young at the time to appreciate the significance of the women's testimony, their actions paved the way for her and a new generation of black women determined to defend themselves against such violence in the future. The Memphis riot, along with similar incidents in New Orleans, Chattanooga, Louisville, and Vicksburg, confirmed Northern beliefs that the federal government had to do more to protect Southern blacks and guarantee their rights as citizens. Outraged by President Johnson's failure to act and inspired by black resistance and determination, the radical wing of the Republican Congress seized control of Reconstruction. In 1866, they refused to seat former Confederates elected to Congress. Making use of their congressional majority, Republicans passed two bills over Johnson's veto. The first bill strengthened and extended the life of the Freedmen's Bureau, established in March 1865, which initially helped ex-slaves and white refugees by providing food, clothing, supplies, and medical services. The Bureau eventually performed marriage ceremonies, established schools, supervised contracts between ex-slaves and their employers, managed confiscated or abandoned lands, and arbitrated legal disputes between black employees and their white employers. The second bill passed by Congress, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, declared that all persons born in the United States were citizens without regard to race, color, or previous condition. Again, in opposition to Johnson's wishes, Congress wrote the 14th Amendment into the Constitution, making it illegal for any state to enforce or make any laws abridging the privileges and immunities of citizens to deny equal protection of the law and or to deprive citizens of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. While Tennessee willingly ratified the 14th Amendment, the other 10 ex-Confederate states refused to adopt the amendment, forcing Congress to pass the Reconstruction Act of 1867, which divided those 10 states into five districts commanded by generals empowered to protect with military force the life and property of blacks. In a follow-up measure, Congress empowered military officials to register voters and oversee new elections. Ex-Confederate states would now have to draft new constitutions, enfranchise black voters, and ratify the 14th Amendment before being readmitted into the Union. In the fall of 1867, James Wells, along with over 60,000 black men and fewer than 50,000 white men registered to vote in Mississippi. Soon afterwards, voters elected 100 delegates, 67 Republicans, 17 of them African Americans, to serve at the Constitutional Convention. In January 1868, the delegates drafted a new state constitution, which accepted the requirement of the 14th Amendment disenfranchised ex-Confederates, granted universal adult male suffrage, and allowed interracial marriages. In protest, a group of leading white men met in Jackson and wrote a white supremacist manifesto in which they resolved to defend the state against Negro domination. They accused the Republican Party of plotting to place the white men of the southern states under the governmental control of their late slaves, and called upon the people of Mississippi to vindicate alike the superiority of their race over the Negro and their political power, and to maintain constitutional liberty. Waving the banner of white supremacy, 
They rallied the Democratic Party and organized to defeat the constitutional referendum by any means necessary. Democrats threatened blacks with loss of employment, evictions from farms, and death if they voted Republican. When James Wells' employer, Bowling, threatened to fire him if he did not vote the Democratic ticket, he bought a new set of tools and went across the street and rented another house. Most black men, however, could not afford to disobey their white employers. Indeed, the threats of violence and loss of livelihood were all too real. The Democratic campaign of terror succeeded. The new state constitution was defeated in June 1868 by almost 8,000 votes, and Democrats won the governorship and four of the five congressional posts. Failure to pass the constitution, however, made the elections invalid. At the same time that Mississippi Democrats learned to make violent use of the political rhetoric of white supremacy, Republicans realized that they would have to organize, educate, and protect a new electorate if they hoped to reconstruct the state. The Loyal League was critical to this effort. Organized in the North during the war, the League had worked to rally support for the Union. Now it branched into the South to ensure black rights. By the fall of 1867, Leagues existed in almost every southern state. The League often operated in secrecy and held night meetings to attract black members who feared for their safety. Not until after the 1868 elections did the League begin to gain ground in the Delta State. James Wells became a member of the Holly Springs branch. The League's efforts paid off when citizens voted in November 1869 to accept the revised Constitution, now shorn of the disenfranchising clauses, and elected James Alcorn, a substantial Delta planter and former slaveholder, as the new Republican governor. Alcorn's administration took office early in 1870, and the new legislature which included 40 black men, ratified the 14th and 15th Amendments and appointed the first black man, Hiram Rhodes Revels, to the U.S. Senate to fulfill the unexpired term of Jefferson Davis. On February 23, 1870, Congress readmitted Mississippi into the Union. Over the next four years, the state legislature approved public education and invested in public buildings and institutions for the poor, the mentally ill, and the physically handicapped. They eliminated racial discrimination from the state laws and in 1873 passed a civil rights bill guaranteeing blacks equal access to all places of public entertainment. While blacks outnumbered whites and voted in large numbers during Mississippi's Reconstruction years, they represented only a small percentage of elected officials. In the first Reconstruction legislature, there were 30 black members, some of whom had been slaves, and by 1871, that number had risen to 38. In 1872, John R. Lynch served as the first black speaker of the State House of Representatives, and in 1874, blacks held several significant positions. A. K. Davis was elected lieutenant governor. James Hill of Holly Springs was appointed secretary of state, and T. W. Cardozo was elected state superintendent of education. In 1875, Blanche K. Bruce, a former slave, was the second black man elected to the state. Although black Mississippians never held offices in proportion to their numbers, they did find inspiration in the few black leaders elected to public office. Indeed, the accomplishments of black men like Lynch, Davis, 
and Bruce left a lasting impression on Ida B. Wells and young black people coming of age in Mississippi during radical reconstruction. If a black man from Mississippi could replace Jefferson Davis in the U.S. Senate, anything seemed possible. Redemption Politics and the Rise of the Rape Myth of course, black political participation did not go unchallenged. The Mississippi Democratic Party, with the assistance of paramilitary groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, the White Rose Society, the Native Sons of the South, and the 76 Society, were determined to regain power over former slaves and to seize control of local and state governments. Thus, they waged war against black people and their Republican allies. Even in the relatively peaceful town of Holly Springs, Ida and her family could not ignore the upsurge of violence that left so many freed people brutalized or dead. When reading newspaper articles to her father and his admiring group of friends, and listening to her parents discuss post-war politics, Ida struggled to grasp the meaning of the words like Ku Klux Klan. Her mother's worried pacing at night whenever James attended a political meeting and reports of the Klan's failed attempt to assassinate Nelson Gill, a founder and leader of the local Loyal League, made Ida keenly aware that the KKK meant something fearful. Indeed, by 1871, Elizabeth had reason to worry, and Ida much to fear. At first, white violence against ex-slaves had been unorganized and directed at individual blacks, but by the 1870s, black communities all over the South had become targets of a systemic campaign of political terror. The KKK, an unofficial arm of the Democratic Party founded in Pulaski, Tennessee, in 1865, 1866, became the most visible symbol of white supremacy and Southern white men's illicit effort to redeem the South. In the early 1870s, during the height of Mississippi Klan violence, night riders, as they were called by Southern blacks, dressed in robes that included pointed hoods and masks that covered their faces, rode through black communities at night, terrifying, threatening, flogging, raping, and murdering blacks and their white allies. In the eastern counties, the Klan was notorious for killing or driving out teachers and burning black schools and churches. Terrorist groups all over the state targeted black men who voted Republican, participated in the Union League, or held political offices. Night Riders murdered politically active black men and raped their wives and daughters. In 1870, organized whites killed two black men who were members of the Lauderdale County Board of Supervisors. In Monroe County, White supremacists disemboweled and cut the throat of Jack Dupree, president of a club of black Republicans, and Klansmen severely whipped A.P. Huggins, the black school superintendent. G. Wiley Wells, district attorney for the northern district of the state and a resident of Holly Springs, argued before a congressional committee that Klan violence served to keep blacks away from the polls so that Democrats would carry the elections. He testified that in the summer of 1871, despite the passage of the state's anti-KKK law the year before, Negroes were coming into Holly Springs imploring him to protect them. It seemed no one was safe. Black women and men who demanded fair pay, broke labor contracts, rented or owned land, or displayed economic success in any way 
risked having their homes invaded by gun-toting night riders. In Winston County, when Nancy Edmonds left her employer's plantation in pursuit of a better job, the Klan whipped her unmercifully and forced her to return. One white Mississippian explained that the Klan sought to keep them blacks from renting land so that the majority of the white citizens may control labor. In Tippa County, organized whites drove blacks off good land, and in Alcorn County, they tried to drive away black laborers on the Gulf and Ohio Railroad. Former slaves who had achieved a modicum of economic success by challenging the exploitative systems of wage labor contracts and sharecropping were seen as threatening white political hegemony and white supremacist ideas. They became the targets of white vigilante terror. White Southerners, like most Americans, understood citizenship in terms of manhood and patriarchal rights and prerogatives. However, resistance to black citizenship, with its implied rights of political, economic, and social equality, took on a sexual connotation because of the association of equality with sexual license. For example, when a congressional committee asked Joseph Beckwith of Columbus, Mississippi, why the Klan had whipped him and his wife, he explained. They said that they understood I had talked some talk concerning some white woman that was not nice. They wanted to run me off. The man I lived with did on account of my crop, and that was why they got the Ku Klux to get after me and that night tried to make me own it, and I told them I didn't say it. Although Beckwith's economic success was probably at the root of the Klan's resentment, by linking it to the supposed insult to white womanhood, Klansmen justified their violent behavior as chivalrous and honorable, while portraying Beckwith as unmanly and unworthy. Beckwith's beating reveals how the alleged protection of white womanhood from insult or injury was tied to the question of black citizenship, and thus became part of the political discourse of Reconstruction. The Beckwith case signaled the post-war emergence of a strict color line that shored up white men's sexual and political power whereas black men and women who dared to push up against these new racial boundaries, or were merely perceived by whites as doing so, risked deadly consequences. White men were at liberty to cross racial lines, especially if doing so reinforced white dominance and democratic power. For example, when Edward Carter of Mississippi testified that the Klan ravished his daughter and ran him off his land because they wanted what he had, he revealed not only how night riders denied him the traditional rights of manhood that would allow him to protect his daughter against rape, but also made clear their complete disregard for the rights of black women. The men who beat Beckwith and his wife and those who raped Carter's daughter wanted to prevent blacks from having what whites had, the rights as citizens to control their labor, to successfully own land, to exercise political power, to protect their families, and to live as respectable men and women. By accusing black men of dishonoring white womanhood and at the same time raping black women, Southern white men articulated on the one hand, deep anxieties about what they understood as the consequences of forced social equality and, on the other hand, a strong desire to maintain sexual dominance over black women. Democrats first expressed their concerns about the question of social equality during the 1864 presidential election when they accused Lincoln and the Republican Party 
of promoting interracial sex, or in their words, miscegnation, a new coinage. In the post-war context, Southern Democrats reasoned that if black men were given the full rights of citizenship, they would inevitably pursue intimate relationships with white women, which for many white Southerners meant the eventual degeneration of the white race. J.R. Smith, a white postmaster and clerk of the Chancery Corps in Meridian, argued that the Democratic Party had successfully convinced whites, especially poor whites, that the Republican Party intended to put the Negro in control, to make a sort of Negro supremacy, to give him the control of the affairs of the government, to put him in office, and gradually to force him into social relations with the white people, to intermingle by marriage with the whites. Joshua S. Morris, a white lawyer in Jackson, agreed, Multitudes of middle and lower classes of whites are induced to believe that republicanism means social equality, that if a man is a republican, he must necessarily be in favor of white people and negroes marrying and associating on terms of perfect equality in the social circle. Convinced that interracial sex would undermine racial hierarchy, Knight Riders policed and punished men and women, most of them black, accused of engaging in interracial sex. Three black women, Betsy Lucas, Eliza Hinton, and Lydia Anderson of Nuxabee County, suffered brutal whippings by Knight Riders who accused them of cohabitating with white men. In Columbus, the Klan whipped George Iryon, a black man, for allegedly keeping a white woman. In the context of black freedom, sex across the color line signified a radical political act, especially on the part of black men and white women, weaving together fears about black political power and anxieties about missing nation miscegnation into a single design. Southern whites converted black men's desires for economic and political equality into a desire for social equality, which they then translated into a threat against white womenhood. The scenario of race, sex, and politics created a powerful alibi for denying black people the basic rights of citizenship and for bringing whites together across class lines. Bringing white men and women together across class divisions was no easy task, but the Democratic Party's success at confounding black male citizenship and interracial sex proved extremely powerful in achieving it. When Knight Riders accused Beckwith of speaking inappropriately about some white woman, while they sought to gain control of his crops, they signaled a slight shift in their ideas about which white women deserved protection. It now seemed that all Southern white women, regardless of class status, were worthy of protection if their alleged assailants were black. Southern whites, in many ways, had always been cautious regarding interactions between black men and white women, but in the post-war context, these concerns began to take on new meanings and acquire a sense of urgency as whites imagined social equality as tantamount to forced sexual relations between black men and white women. With the Confederacy's defeat, the simplest exchanges between black men and white women assumed a more menacing tone for many white Southerners. Southern white men anxiously sought the reinstitution of a strict gender and racial hierarchy dependent on black defense and white female subordination. Post-war, however, they extended protection to all white women, not just southern ladies. In the antebellum south and during the Civil War, protection 
devolved upon the honor of elite white women. When the Knight Riders portrayed Beckwith's economic success as an insult to white womanhood generally, they intentionally encompassed all white women so that whites would stand together across class lines. The sexualized language of social equality resonated with most Southern white men and women, regardless of class, because it squared with their ideas about white supremacy and traditional gender roles. What honorable white man would not heed the call to protect white womanhood, and what self-respecting white woman would not deem herself worthy of protection? Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to leave your comments down below. I would love to hear from you guys. And if you stayed till the end, make sure to let me know. Um, give me a little book emoji. Um, so make sure to subscribe to my channel if you want to continue along with me in my reading of racism in America. If you want to continue seeing any videos from me, please do make sure to subscribe. Do please give it a like and make sure to comment down below because I would love to know your guys' thoughts and opinions about these excerpts. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Bye.